Well, we're switching focus a bit now from uh, the memorial focus, which we have had and will continue in prayer later, uh, to um, this passage from Romans chapter 3. We're going to take a look at the meaning of the gospel today. I think it, you'll find it pretty interesting stuff, but let's ask the Lord to do His work as we are gather around His Word. Lord, it's good to be one church in the big house together, and we are so glad that you are present with us. Pray that even now your spirit, who is mighty, would lift us up into the presence of Christ, reveal to our, the eyes of our hearts the truth of the gospel, and allow us, we pray, to walk down the road to the joy of that salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So from Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 21 and following, now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness now at the present time so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The secret things belong to the Lord our God that we may do all the words of this law. Well, one of the privileges of being your pastor and being in leadership here is to get to be on other boards and do some leadership in the community. You probably already knew that. I'm in my seventh year as the chairman of the Christian Outreach Center Board, which I love, and I've just gotten to complete a year as a trustee for the Dunham School, which I also love. But you may not know one of my uh, most prestigious positions that I hold, have held. I don't think you knew that I was an officer of a yacht club. You don't believe me, it's true. It's the Brevard Yacht Club. Now, sadly, I'm not referring to one of the several rather sparkly yacht clubs on the Gold Coast in Brevard County, Florida. This would be the Brevard, North Carolina Yacht Club. We have two vessels. One is a paddle boat, and the other is a raft. Now, the membership terms are quite exclusive. To be a member of the Brevard Yacht Club requires that you paddle or row out into the center of a very small pond with me and consume a beverage. <laughs> After that, you're in for life. I have a Commodore's cap. I even have a logoed polo shirt. I have been the Commodore of the Yacht Club. But ever since the raft got holes in it, membership has fallen on hard times. <laughs> Half of our fleet is dry docked, and until we find some really good raft patches, I'm not sure there's going to be an uptake in membership. More seriously, I've been thinking a lot about membership because last week we had 17 confirmation students join the church. They are now active and voting members of First Presbyterian Church. They prepared ever since August for that moment. But it makes you wonder, what does it mean to be a member of this church? What do you get from being a member? Is it as prestigious and important as being part of the Brevard Yacht Club? Or just as silly as that? And what is asked of you because you are a member? Well, membership in a Presbyterian church forms around five essential questions. It doesn't form around money or ethnicity or address. It forms around five essential questions, which I've discovered actually interweave pretty beautifully with what you might have heard called years ago the Roman road to salvation. Did you ever remember hearing that term? It's where people extract a series of beautiful verses from Paul's letter to the Romans in the New Testament and show step by step how Paul's letter progresses through the stages that lead to salvation and then discipleship in Jesus Christ. 
Paul's prologue to Romans, he begins by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So today, for our one church service, I thought it would be fun to interweave the five membership questions with the Roman road and see how they go together. Shall we try? We'll see if we can pull this off. Question number one for membership, and I always give a disclaimer when I'm teaching this to confirmation students or new members, <laughs> is be warned, the first question is negative marketing. It is close to being offensive. In fact, it is highly uncomfortable. It's an odd way to start a question for prospective members. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God without hope for your salvation except in His saving mercy? What kind of marketing is that? Hi. Welcome to our church. Do you realize that you are helpless and hapless and hopeless? Want to join? It is this reversal of propaganda or of promises that says right here we are the fellowship of people who are a mess. We form around a common need. I am not sufficient in myself. I can't make it work. In fact, when I start down the Roman road to salvation, in Romans 1, 18, Paul tells us this, for the wrath of God, and we could get that, I don't have that slide, I got, it's in my head. <laughs> for the wrath of God has come upon all forms of unrighteousness. For though they knew God, they, we, did not honor him as God or give thanks. Therefore, God has made them futile in their thinking, and we are under condemnation. That's how Paul starts out the body of his letter to the Romans. The condition of humanity is under the wrath of God because of our unrighteousness. We are more than just mistake makers. We are sin committers. God has a will for humanity, and we have said, I prefer my will. God has shown us a way to life, and we have said, I think I can do better. And we arrive here as those who say, I have tried doing better, and it doesn't work. Here at last, I can be free and honest. If you take a few more steps down the Roman road to salvation, you realize this is a big theme for Paul. In Romans 3, he tells us that all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Three chapters later in Romans 6 he says, and the wages of that sin is death. Christianity has a stark realism about humanity, an in-your-face realization that the natural condition of me in the world is perilous. And isn't that so relieving? I can arrive here amongst those who have affirmed question number one and say, oh, I don't have to build my resume with you anymore, do I? Because I'm not all right and neither are you. And we love that because we can say it to each other. I don't have to prepare my defense. I don't have to shout out my accomplishments. I don't have to pretend or be full of pretense. I don't have to put on a better face than I am. I arrive here and say, I am a mess, and I'm under condemnation for the wrong things I have done, and there's damage on my soul and blood on my hands. Is anybody else with me in this room? Yes, thanks be to God. I love Christianity's realism. So different than anybody trying to sell you a product. First question out of the box is to say, can you go down in order to be lifted up? Can you drop the mask in order to receive the true identity? Are you willing to be part of this hapless, hopeless, and helpless group of sinners? Yep, come on in then. Because after the first negative question, we have some really good news. God has not left us alone. 
Question two of the membership vows says this. So, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you receive and depend on him alone for your salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Bad news, I cannot do this on my own and I am in deep trouble with God. Good news is, God already knew that and determined to send a savior. He is the Lord Jesus. He is the savior of sinners, the forgiver of transgressors, the washer of indelible stains, the reliever of damaged consciences because he has come to save us from ourselves. And I come here to look to him. I can't do my life. Christ has done my life and I'm trusting in him. Both those very negative passages you saw on the screen from Romans, watch the second half of them. In Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you want to work for the meaning and purpose of your life and hold it up to God and say, look what I did? That way leads to death. You'll get paid in what you have done. But the free gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Back in Romans 3, Paul said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified by faith as a gift because of the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We celebrate the ultimate switcheroo. My record on my own is bad, stained, mottled. Christ's record as a man among us was one of fidelity and love and perfection. And he says, I'll give you my record and I'll take yours. You get a new record that you don't deserve and I'm gonna give you a new heart so that what I've already given you as your record, you can start to live that as your true identity. Keep walking down the Roman road of salvation. Romans 5 says, for the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. What happens? Christ comes and accomplishes salvation for us and then says, now I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna pour my spirit into your heart so you can say yes to me, and be joined to me, and all that is mine becomes yours and I'm extracting all that gook out of you. It's gonna take a long time, but the end is already here. It's already accomplished. You are forgiven, wiped clean, made new. Now we're gonna work that out in daily life by the spirit given to you. How does that work? Well, keep going down the Roman road to salvation and you get to chapter 10 and we're told something very clear. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's an external part of it. I'm gonna speak aloud. This guy is the one I'm following. He's the master. He rules. I'm with him. And I'm internally gonna give my internal allegiance of, and I believe that his story is the one I wanna be joined to. He died and he rose. Impossibly, the dead man got up and I've yielded my heart, soul, and mind to that. I believe it and I'm willing to say it. So down the Roman road is the assurance, if those two things are true, you are saved from your sin and yourself, and you've entered the fellowship of redeemed sinners that's here. It's a pretty good first two questions, don't you think? Well, question three follows pretty naturally from that. It asks, do you now promise and resolve in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as followers of Christ? They must have put that word endeavor in there for my mom because youth group in her days was called Christian Endeavor and she hated it. And endeavor is such an odd word because it just means to try. Do you now promise and resolve in reliance on the Holy Spirit that you're gonna try to be a follower of Christ? So we've had this negative question, smack right in the face. Do you agree that you're a sinner without hope? Yep. 
Then we have this positive question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Savior of sinners? Yes. And now the action question. So then, are you going to be his disciple? Do you promise and resolve to follow him as best you can? Are you ready to go day by day following him until it accumulates into a lifetime of being formed in his image? The Roman road of salvation, the next step, chapter 12, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your body to him as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's the lifetime of discipleship. Day by day, I show up in prayer before God and I say, here I am. I'm a living sacrifice. You were the blood sacrifice that took away my sin. I'm the available sacrifice saying, your will is to be my will. I want to go where you lead me. I want to become like you. Isn't it interesting that the first three questions that we ask before you join the church have absolutely zero to do with this particular church? I love that. We're not trying to get more members for Club First Press to enhance our club stats. We want to know, and nor do we think, we're the only game in the world. <laughs> we're the only church that has it right. Would you like to be part of the one true church? Join here. <sighs> that would be pretty pitiful if that's all God had was us. Rather, present company accepted, of course, <laughs> right? <clears throat> Rather, we're saying we are forming around a core of a universal church that is multi-millennial in age, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, that has appeared in all times and places throughout the world where anyone who's joined to Jesus has formed around these three questions. Are you a sinner? Is Jesus the savior of sinners? Do you want to follow him as his disciple? That's the heart and soul of Christian faith. It's true whether you're Catholic or Orthodox or any form of Protestant throughout the entire world, these are what we form around. They're the core of the ancient vows of baptism. Then the next thing we want to know, question four, is a question about community. Do you want to do that universal thing here with these people? Do you promise to serve Christ in his church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service to God and its ministry to others to the best of your ability? Christ's church is huge. There's two billion of us or more, but all church is local church. The best way to be part of the universal church of Jesus Christ is to be wedded and committed to one local body. Throughout the world, it's the local church everywhere. Sometimes you see believers get restless and they think, well, maybe there's more Jesus over there. Maybe there's more a sense of the world church over there. Maybe if I just skim virtually around all the best preachers and all the best worship leaders, I'll get more. And Jesus said, no, I put you in community because this is where the church forms so that the world can see this is what it looks like to be mine in all the day-to-day -day mess of consistently living out faith with the same people over and over, day by day, year by year, this is what we've agreed to do. Now, of course, people get transferred, they move, they retire, but we ask the question, for this season of your life, can you commit to this particular body of believers who have all said together, I'm a sinner, saved by grace, joined to Jesus by the Spirit, and I'm trying to follow him. You want to come too? Let's do this together. The fifth question is, is a lot. Oh, actually, there was a, um, there's a great scripture from Romans 12 a little further on. Got to get it. We're moving towards the end here, but hang in. This is all so cool. Paul says right after the present your bodies, he says, by the way, we though many are one body in Christ and members one of another. There's a whole theology of the church there. There's no such thing as an isolated 
individual Christian who doesn't belong to anyone else. That's not a Christian. To be a Christian is to be joined to Jesus whose body is all the people in all the world who are joined to him. You never get to be a member of Jesus like you're the member of some internet club that's gonna send you a new jam every week. It's an organic joining to his body, the church. All Christianity is in community. Otherwise, you're outside of what Christ wants to do with you. Well, the fifth question is very much like it, but it's also very important. It basically asks if you're willing not only to do your discipleship here, but also to submit to the leadership that has been chosen by this body and to promote the unity and harmony of the body. Let's get the fifth question up there. So do you submit yourselves, that's another bad marketing word, to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and to the spiritual oversight of this church session? And do you promise to promote the unity, the purity, and the peace of the church? Paul goes on in Romans 12 to say that he's praying and encouraging them that they would have one voice in glorifying God. They would be in such harmony one with one another and such accord with Christ that the voice of the Roman church would be one voice praising God. Our unity is our best evangelism. Our harmony around these gospel truths, our open exchange and a mission of them in our lives is the best witness we'll ever have to the world far better than any like strategy or particular plans. If a church is energized and unified around these essential core teachings of the gospel, the world will be drawn to us. That's why these passages are so important. Let me move towards close with an illustration, how this worked out for me. Some years ago now, I was, as many of you were, part of the Promise Keepers movement in our country. It was a great call to men to come back and consecrate themselves to Jesus and to their families, to their communities, and to racial reconciliation. One of the visions was of Promise Keepers was to gather on the mall in Washington, and there were, by all estimates, some 650 to 750,000 men that came to repent of our sins and commit ourselves to the cause of Christ. Now on that day, it was pretty moving because we were on the part of the mall there in Washington that was covered with gravel. And they had all of us, three quarters of a million of us, get down on our faces. And I was on my face in the gravel and it's become an emblem for what it means to belong to Christ. To first bow to the ground in contrition, in sorrow, for all the ways I've participated in the brokenness of the world and in sinning against God. I bowed to the ground, imagining that I was holding out my hands to cling to the cross. <laughs> Nothing in my arms I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And we stayed there on our faces, but the reason for bowing moved from guilt and confession to gratitude and praise, that there at the foot of the cross, that groveling in the gravel, as it were, was the news that the blood of Christ atoned for all the sin of all those three quarters of a million men on their faces in the ground. And I was so grateful to be at the foot of the cross. And then while I was still down with my face, I looked up and I looked over and I saw the guy next to me. And I saw the guy next to me. Just like when I imagine you with me at the foot of the cross, and I look up and realize, oh, it's you. You're here too. Are you here too, confessing your sin? Are you here too, realizing Christ's forgiveness? Is that us, all of us on our faces on the ground at the cross, peeking around and realizing we're all here included, names etched in the handprints of Christ? That's the beauty of Christ's church around which we form. Sinners freely admitting it, saved by grace beyond comprehension that washes away those stains, and committed to saying, and I will follow him the rest of my days, and I've decided I'm gonna do it with you. Is that what you want? Could you form your life around those things that we've said together? 
I want to give you a chance to do that. Following the next hymn, we'll be standing together and I'm going to ask you the membership vows. And I hope that there will be a thunderous reply as we say to him, yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have called us to the truth and the freedom of the gospel. We thank you for Paul's leading us down the Roman road of salvation through sin to forgiveness to discipleship to the unity of the church. Would you form us as one church for the sake of the world? Amen. Church, are you ready to renew your affirmation of the essentials of our faith? Are you ready to take your membership vows again? If you're visiting with us or you're from another church, remember the first three questions unite all Christians all through time and place. It's only the second, the last two that are specific to us. But shall we, as one, acknowledge what we believe? Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God without hope for your salvation, except in his saving mercy, do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of sinners? And do you now receive and depend on Him alone for your salvation as He's offered in the gospel? Do you? I do. And do you now promise and resolve in humble reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as followers of Christ? Do you? I do. And do you promise to serve Christ in His church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service of God and its ministry to others to the best of your ability, do you? I do. And do you submit yourselves again to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, the spiritual oversight of this church session, and do you promise to promote the unity, the purity, and the peace of Christ's church, do you? I do. Here again the words of Paul. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, brothers and sisters, you have been, you are being, and you will be saved. Amen. 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 Please do be seated.